Center in Woodburn. And then it goes on to say media releases were sent out and updated and information was shared through multiple social media platforms to help reach as many people as possible. The spokesperson added, and again, we know this, the fires moved really rapidly and that, quote, other challenges which were present that night included power outages, cell phone outages, and the remote locations where the fires occurred. OPB covered a similar situation in Jackson County where alerts didn't go out flat out about the Alameda fire and FEMA said their alert system there, which Jackson County uses, apparently had never been tested. They also said again the fires moved incredibly quickly, causing mass confusion. So the big question moving forward, what do we do? Which warning systems would serve us better in times like these? So for answers, I turned to researchers at Portland State University and they said often the county systems are incredibly reliable and for the most part they worked very well. They really credited Clackamas County for throughout most of the fires with how well they worked. These fires, they pointed out again, were just especially chaotic, especially right after that windstorm. And they also pointed out there's a gap in our ability to predict and to warn about wildfires. Now this is getting bigger because they said that gap. There really isn't one system that takes into account all of the factors that fuel wildfires, including but not limited to topography, the types of forests where fires start, dry weather made worse by climate change, and the big factor this last time, the wind. There's no centralized place to go and look for all of these different ingredients to large destructive wildfires right now. So, um, you know, I think about the, what happened over Labor Day weekend here in Oregon, and I was looking at, as a meteorologist, I was looking at the wind forecasts, and it was a struggle for me to really, to kind of understand how that would play into the existing conditions in the forests. Um, you know, I, I tried to look at several different websites and several different pieces of information to try and put that together to just kind of understand, well, what are, you know, what, what's the potential for, for really large and destructive fires based on this wind forecast I'm seeing. And I think, you know, it was, it was a challenge. So again, it was a challenge for the experts. That researcher, Andrew Martin, actually compared our lack of ability to predict wildfires and warn about wildfires to that of hurricanes, AKA, he says the hurricane warning system is way better. And I get that it's weird to be jealous of hurricanes, but I digress. It's better, he says, because in large part, scientists have put time, effort, and research into centralizing all the factors that make for horribly destructive hurricanes into one warning system. And that hasn't happened with wildfires yet. So you might be thinking, okay, great. Why don't they just do that? Well, one reason is the big variable in this. That's the wind. Violent, rare windstorms aren't easy to predict. There's not a lot of data on them. They're rare. And it's only predictable really a few days ahead of time, which happened in this case. That said, even a few days of warning is huge, right? Well, the researchers that we talked to obviously agree, and they say there are other factors that we could add into kind of a new, more effective and more specific system as well. Take a listen. And I think also that we can improve um, the warning um, urgency uh, if we take into account the land use around different communities. For instance, we know that very um, mature, not that many left, but mature um, oil growth forests are much more difficult to burn by a fire than a homogeneous, um, especially young plantation. And so if I happen to be living in a small town surrounded by young plantations that are very homogeneous, I am at a much higher risk if I am surrounded by an um, area that has either very old growth or complex heterogeneous different conditions of, of land use of forest um, uh, that when the fire comes will actually have trouble um, burning it very quickly. All right, so here's some good news. Both of them told me that there are researchers out there who are working on a centralized kind of more specific system like this, but nothing that sophisticated is up and running yet, let alone ready to test in a real emergency. So in the meantime, it's kind of up to all of us to combine a lot of these factors ourselves, and that means paying attention to weather forecasts about wind, humidity, lightning, watching for red flag alerts, which have to do uh, with fire potential, and heating those county alert systems. All that said, 
Now another huge question is how did these wildfires start and a lot of that because we get this question from a lot of people is still under investigation but some fires are being blamed on power lines knocked down during that Labor Day windstorm like the devastating fires that tore through the San Yam Canyon eventually merging with the Beachy Creek fire further up in the Cascades. There is no, I want to stress this, there is no official cause yet, but an incident report released earlier this month says downed power lines sparked at least 13 fires in that area. And now there's a class action lawsuit against Pacific Power. Fire victims claim the power company kept their power lines energized despite being warned about extreme fire weather. And they claim power lines sparked those massive fires destroying homes, businesses, and schools. At this point, Pacific Power isn't commenting. This is ongoing, uh, an ongoing case, but we talked to the lawyer representing the victims in that lawsuit, and he believes this could have been prevented if the power lines had been turned off. I think it's sort of shocking when companies that know the right thing to do, they know what the right thing to do, they know how to do it, and then just choose not to do it. Um, you know, I, that, that really upsets me, um, and it leads to these kinds of, you know, people dying, uh, people losing their homes, their pets, um, et cetera. So, you know, yes, I'm a lawyer and I'm representing these people, but it really, it, 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 it tears me up to know that we could have prevented a lot of these fires. We did not have to have these um, property destroying fires. At the same time, Oregon Senators Ron Wyden and Jeff Merkley also want answers. Today, they sent a letter to the U.S. Forest Service and the Oregon Department of Forestry saying, quote, we would like you to analyze what role the downed power lines played in the Beachy Creek fire. And if so, could more have been done to prevent these power lines from starting fires in the windstorm? End quote. Now, it's worth mentioning that right before that Labor Day windstorm, Portland General Electric decided to shut off power to this area near Mount Hood, as well as areas in Clackamas and Marion County. And that's the first time they've ever done that preemptively because of fire risk. We asked them today if they think it helped, and they told us so far they're not aware of any wildfires that sparked from their equipment. Now, tragically and famously, we've seen this kind of same dynamic play out on a much bigger and deadlier stage in California. The utility company PG&E, uh, different from PGE here in Oregon, filed for bankruptcy because of so many lawsuits stemming from the massive deadly campfire in 2018. That's the one that burned Paradise, California. Their equipment was blamed for starting that fire and other fires in the state. And Brandon Riddiman from our sister station in Sacramento has a look at how exactly power lines can spark wildfires in part of his series, Fire Power Money. I want to show you a moment you rarely get to see in real life. The moment a power grid sparks a fire. The vast majority of those fires start on distribution lines. That's industry talk for these, the power lines in your neighborhood, usually up on wooden poles. The fire hazard mainly comes from trees growing too close. You get a big windstorm and it blows part of the tree into the line. Sparks shower down onto the ground below. And now you've got a fire up and running with the wind. Some version of this is what was behind most of the fires blamed on PG&E in 2017. And it shows you why the law requires power companies to keep trees trimmed back. Simply put, power lines are more likely to start a fire during the kind of weather that's most dangerous, bad wind. But this sort of thing doesn't tend to happen on the kind of power line where the campfire started. On that day, PG&E says it had a problem with a transmission line. We're talking about these big steel towers that carry high voltage over huge distances. Usually when you get bad wind, these lines should be safe because they're taller than the trees. But on that day, the wind may have exposed a different problem. PG&E says it had a weak link. An old hook was worn down and it appears to have broken in the wind. That may have allowed part of the line to swing free and hit the tower, showering the brush below in molten metal. Worse, it happened on a steep hill that was really hard to reach. By the time fire crews showed up, there was no stopping it. When the fire got to the hilltop, it started to shower all of paradise in embers. All right, so Brandon Brandeman is joining me now. Uh, Brandon, again, from our sister station in Sacramento, ABC 10, and also the man, the myth, the legend behind Fire Power Money, which we just saw a part of. And Brandon, again, just phenomenal reporting, just phenomenal, so well done. 
Uh, we wanted to talk to you and pick your brain about the situation in Oregon. And you said one of the mo things that kind of stood out to you the most was the fact that these proactive shutoffs are happening here. And just, I mean, what does that tell you? Why did that stand out to you? It's a big shift, and, and here's why. We've seen this migrate from Southern California to Northern California already, and the, the fact that the utility is taking this proactive step to shut circuits down says they at least have seen what's going on in California, and they think us too. At least they're on the spectrum, and that tells you they may have problems with tree trimming, problems with maintenance of the equipment, um, that they just haven't sized up fully yet. Uh, and want to get their arms around, but they shut down circuits because they're not sure they'll make it through a windstorm without sparking a fire. And as you know, we're not even into our windiest season yet, and everything's tinder dry enough that we've hit record breaking acreage. 100%, which is so ominous to think about. We've been talking about warning systems too in this show up until now. And uh, you mentioned that power companies are basically getting in on that game. They, it's, it's smart for them to do so, obviously. When it comes to the forecasting, yeah, um, we had problems in the mid to late 2000s down in San Diego with their for-profit utility, uh, which now is considered sort of the, the golden boy in the room whenever they get together at the regulator because they've really um, put a lot of effort into really micro forecasting the weather along their grid. So when they have a power line that runs up a windy canyon, they can almost down to the mile tell you what the conditions are. So if there's this one particularly windy spot, they can try to take tailor a shutoff and make it as small as possible. And I should say, you do want them doing shutoffs if they think they need to do them. The whole point is to prevent burning down homes and killing people. I know it's unpopular and there are safety issues with shutting the power off as well. Uh, and that's where you really have to start making plans if that becomes part of what you're doing during fire season. Yeah, definitely good to keep in mind, especially as you pointed out as we go into the windy season. All right, Brandon Riddiman, uh, I want to point out, you, you told me and reminded me, thank you, season two of Firepower Money is coming out and it's never been more important for us Oregonians to watch it and get up to speed on these issues. So thank you so much. Thank you. How do you find out if something fishy is going on when the Postal Service removes dozens of blue boxes? Obviously, you gather data on every single blue box there is. At least, that's what we did when the story continues. Welcome back, everybody, to The Story. I'm Maggie Vespa in for Dan. 
We have so much more to get to, so watch with your phone in your hand because we're all slaves to technology. And get ready to let us know what you think. You can chat with me on Facebook, you can email the story at kgw.com, or you can tweet us using the hashtag HeyDan. That never changes. All right, let's get to some of your comments now. John JDI tweeted a question about mail in voting. He asked, Hey Dan, what happens to all the early voting ballots sent in prior to Election Day? Are they kept safe and opened on Election Day, or are they counted? and recorded but kept secret? That is an awesome question because we are such political nerds here and we love it. So here's what we found out. Once a voter mails in their ballot and it gets to their county elections office, the first thing that happens is a staff member in immediately verifies their signature. If there's an issue and they can't verify it for some reason, they set it aside for a closer look. If it isn't signed at all, they try and contact the voter. Once it's good to go, all the ballots get sorted by precinct, but they can't be counted until seven days before Election Day. And this year, that's October 27th. Only then do elections employees start opening the envelopes and counting the ballots. But, another but, the results of those mail-in votes cannot be made public until after 8 p.m. on Election Day. And those are the early results you always hear about right at 8. So I hope that answers your question, John. Thank you so much for writing in. And hey, speaking of the election, the efficiency of mail-in voting comes down to the Postal Service. Don't we all know that this year? You might remember these images making their way around Twitter in August. People freaked out, okay? A lot of people were really upset, dare I say enraged, to learn the Post Office was removing blue mailboxes, especially with an election coming up. The Postmaster called it a cost-cutting measure, and he stopped it amid that deafening public outcry. Uh, but that wasn't the end of the story. Not as far as Kyle Eboshi was concerned. He is obsessive, isn't he? Suffice it to say, Kyle did some digging. A lot of digging. Remember this photo? A blue collection box being removed from a Portland neighborhood back in August. The image went viral. Then there were similar photos, like this one from Eugene, along with various reports of disappearing mailboxes in other states, sparking speculation that President Trump might be trying to sabotage mail-in voting. This is the kind of fight that most Americans have a side they want to be on. And it is not the side that is stealing the mailboxes and telling us that, mm, yeah, it doesn't think you don't think it's going to work out for you to get your ballot in on time. The public outcry was fierce. Oregon's Democratic senators held a press conference. We are not going to let Donald Trump and his bullies take away that sacred vote by mail effort. And Congressman Peter DeFazio created a video. They're not getting this one. Facing intense backlash, on August 18th, Postmaster General Louis DeJoy halted operational cost-cutting changes until after the 2020 election, including the removal of those blue collection boxes. DeJoy later testified before a House Oversight Committee. If you wouldn't mind uh, telling us about the process briefly of the removal of the blue boxes, who ordered them, and uh, how that came about. So, so this is a, a, a long-standing uh, 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 thing that's been going on in the Postal Service for a long time. Uh, Suggested there was nothing sinister going on. I am not engaged in sabotaging the election. Which got me wondering, what's the real story behind those disappearing mailboxes? To find out, I submitted a Freedom of Information Act to the U.S. Postal Service, asking for a breakdown of every blue mailbox. Mm -hmm. It was a huge list and showed over the past five years, more than 17,000 collection bins have been removed across the country. It's nothing new. Dozens of blue mailboxes seen discarded like trash behind a- The disappearing mailboxes may seem more pronounced recently in some areas, but the data shows since DeJoy was appointed Postmaster General in May, the greatest number of collection boxes were removed from both traditional blue and red states, including Oregon, Texas, Florida, New Jersey, and Nebraska. A closer look at the boxes removed recently in Oregon shows many came from the heavily populated left-leaning Portland and Eugene areas, but other more conservative rural areas in southern and eastern Oregon lost their blue boxes too. A Postal Service spokesperson explained boxes removed in Oregon this year were duplicates, where there were two or three in one location, and decisions are based on mail volume. More specifically, a 2016 Inspector General report said Collection bins are taken out if they receive fewer than 25 pieces a day, which strongly suggests, along with the data, that these blue boxes have been disappearing because people just aren't using them, not because of politics. Kyle Aboshi, KGW News. Very interesting.
All right, there is still one more topic that we obviously have to get to, and that's the fact that the president of the United States is in the hospital right now with COVID-19. And for now, President Trump is still in charge of the country. No powers have been transferred to Vice President Mike Pence. The president will be working out of the so-called presidential offices at Walter Reed Medical Center in Maryland. All three of those sentences are sentences I never expected to read this year or really any year. In the coming days, there will be questions about how serious the president's condition is and how transparent the White House is being about it. In fact, those questions are already being asked by a lot of people. The truth will come out. It always does. And we know that, and we're saying that, because of history. Presidential historian Michael Beschloss spent much of his day tweeting about various times in history that an American president's health came into question. Like this photo from FDR's Democratic acceptance speech in 1944. The man on the left was his cardiologist, and he was cropped out of the final photo so that Americans wouldn't learn that FDR had severe cardiovascular disease. In fact, most Americans didn't know that FDR was seriously ill, but this photo shows the debilitating effect his health problems were having on his body. It was taken the day before he died in office. On the other hand, President Lyndon Johnson was tired of false rumors about gallbladder surgery. So in 1965, he lifted his shirt to reporters to put rumors to rest. And this was the scene in the White House Situation Room on March 30th, 1981, right after President Ronald Reagan was shot. Then Vice President George H.W. Bush was there just in case. And even when Reagan was shot, he stayed in charge. In fact, there have only been three times in history that a president has invoked the 25th Amendment to hand over power temporarily to the vice president. The first was President Reagan in 1985, then George W. Bush in 2002, and again in 2007, all three times because they were undergoing anesthesia. We're not there yet. We, told, we are told that the president has mild symptoms. But let's be clear, this is the most serious health crisis a sitting president has faced since Reagan was shot. And if we've learned anything from history and from this historic year, it's important to take a moment and recognize the times that we're living through as we're living through them. And once again, we wish the president, the first lady, and everyone else battling COVID-19 a full and speedy recovery. We're gonna finish the story next.
Hey guys, welcome back. A lot of questions and comments coming in. This one from Terry. When are the ballots mailed out for us in Southwest Washington? Our producers saw your question, got the answer already. All Washington ballots are being mailed out on October 16th. Uh, and then Sharon Wind tweeted, thanks for the story. What about burying power lines? Would that be too costly? That's a really interesting question. We'll try to look into that for you and see if we can have an answer next week. Also getting a lot of love for Brandon's segment uh, that explains how power lines can start fires. That whole series, Fire Power Money, is available on YouTube right now. Season one is out. Season two is coming later this month. I'll post it on my social media pages. In the meantime, that's the story. Thank you for joining us. The news with Laurel Porter is coming up next.